majority and carry forward in a sensible way. I'm terribly sorry, but I won't give way because I'm going to conclude. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Githens. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, this morning I left my home not far from the town of St Andrews in my constituency to set off on my regular commute, like other members of this House in different parts of the United Kingdom, quite literally by plane, train and automobile. Like most weeks, like many of us, I had no idea when I'd be going home um, to my family and to my constituents. But unlike most weeks, I, my family and my constituents had no idea that by the time I got home, whether or not I would still be afforded the rights and privileges that, are, that EU citizens take as their own. What a state to be in all these years on. And this is why today, can I thank the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset and, and, and the Right Honourable Member for Derby South as well, and to, to their colleagues for, for, for the work that they've put in to their amendments that obviously we'll be backing this evening. And I thank them for that. But what a state to be in all these years on. Because we're not here for any other reason than an attempt to offset a Tory civil war. This disaster is years in the making. And we're only in this situation because once upon a time, David Cameron decided to call an EU referendum so that he could have avoided a full-blown Tory <laughs> civil war. Now, there are many who will disagree with me in this yes. House. Yes. 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 Well, I'm not sure yes. Yes. there are many who will disagree with me in saying that it's not working very well, is it? How's that attempt to avoid a Tory civil war going? Minister wants to intervene after that? No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Because we have a full blown civil war. And this is a Tory party determined to take the rest of us down with them as well. And what today's amendment gives us the opportunity to do is for the moment stave off that opportunity that they are trying to give to us. Because the Prime Minister continues to appeal to the hardliners in her own party rather than face up to the realities of minority government. But this is a lost cause. The Brexiteers who campaigned without any sort of plan are the ones who got us out of this mess. And frankly, the message to the Prime Minister must be, Mr Speaker, that they are unlikely to get us out of it. Now, it's not for me to judge Conservative Party management. The voters will have their opportunity to do that in due course. But what strikes me is just how enthralled this Conservative Party and this Prime Minister is to the extremists in her own party. And with that, I want to praise some of the members on the other side, because there are members who have stuck their neck out. There are members, and I disagree with them, and they disagree with me, but let's look at the way they've been treated. Now, the members for, um, for Grantham yeah. and Stamford, who's in his place, and the member for Leicestershire South, and I disagree over plenty. And we disagree over Brexit. He wants us to leave the European Union. I don't. But he finds himself in a situation whereby when we see these, with these, these um, positive proposals, we don't always agree, or when we see one that's even accepted by the government, as was the case for the member for Leicester, Leicestershire South, the member present finds himself deselected, and the member for Leicestershire South finds himself sacked. And yet all along, and I disagree with them for this, they have backed the Prime Minister's deal. What does that tell you? What does that tell you about trying to find some kind of consensus? What does that tell you about trying to reach across? This is a government that is enthralled to the very extremes, and it is something that we cannot put up with any longer in this House. Let's just look at the invitation list to those who were treated to lunch at Chequers, yeah. the very people voting against the Prime Minister. This tells us everything about a Prime Minister who has lost control about her own, of her own party and who has, who has um, dragged us into this folly. And I'll give way to the Honourable Lady because she's got some experience in this. I, I do. Indeed, <laughs> and I'm very grateful to giving way. Did it strike him as being quite perverse 
that the very people invited to Chequers were the very people who in December had sought a motion of no confidence in the Prime Minister as leader of the Conservative Party and had plotted against her. But is he also aware that a lot of Conservative associations hold their annual general meetings at the end of this week? And does he share my concern that too many honourable and right honourable members opposite will be more concerned about the outcome of those AGMs than the effect of a no deal or indeed any Brexit on their constituents? The, the, the Honourable Lady knows the Conservative Party much, Tick much better top. than I do, and it, and it shows, and, and she makes a very, very valid point. Oh, I don't know. And the point is this, Mr Speaker, <laughs> it is a small, elitist group of Conservative MPs, yep. all men, incidentally, who are vote invited to Chequers, incidentally, who have failed, and failed spectacularly, on their pet, lifelong political project. Yep. Mr Speaker... I wouldn't let this lot anywhere near the TV remote in my house, never mind the most important decision that we have to make for generations. And I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful for giving way. Can we extend that, Can we extend that actually, to listen to the, apparently a mob of people that will rebel um, if ever we are not going to deliver this vote of the people, and nobody listens to the peaceful million, the five million people who want to actually revert our Article 50. They're not death-threatening us, they're not mobbing us, they are just peaceful people, and yet we are worried about those keyboard warriors who will threaten us from um, the security of their homes. Is that not also wrong? And the argument lady makes a very powerful point about the way that millions protested peacefully on Saturday. And I'm delighted that our First Minister joined them, as did the leader of the Liberal Democrats, colleagues in the Labour Party, and even some Conservative we colleagues as well. And they were right to have done so. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is effectively out of power and we need to move on. Debating her particular position, which, as you have rightly pointed out, has been rejected twice overwhelmingly, means that it becomes more and more pointless to debate the Prime Minister's <coughs> deal with every passing hour. And the, and the opposition spokesperson was right to point that out too. The House of Commons must seize control of this process tonight so that we can hold those indicative votes and start, start to find out a, a way out of this mess. Now, we know from the UK government's own warnings that the Prime Minister's deal is not in the, Prime Min uh, is not in the best interest of anybody in the UK. And we know that no deal is not in anybody's best interest either. And this Parliament has come together and has rejected both the Prime Minister's deal and no deal. Comprehensively, they have been rejected. Would he give way on that? But having wasted almost three years, the government has run out of options and run out of ideas, and we need to step up. Now, believe it or not, Mr Speaker, none of this should give us any pleasure. Where we are today is not a farce. It is now a tragedy, and a tragedy that is taking us all down with us. And I say somebody who, as you know, fundamentally wants Scotland to be an independent state, yeah. but it, gives me, yeah. it really gives me no pleasure when I speak to colleagues overseas and see that the UK's international reputation is broken. And that hurts all of us. And I, it doesn't give me any great pleasure, and I assure colleagues, it gives me no great pleasure to have to say that. When I was working in the European institutions, I can remember that overall in the EU, and I'm appealing to the Minister, I know, and I know the Minister works hard on this as well, that the UK could be a real force for good. Now, I didn't always agree with everything the UK was there for, but I acknowledge many of the positive contributions made by UK <coughs> citizens to the EU project. And I think it's right that all of us acknowledge that. What was more striking, however, was the way in which the UK and Ireland worked as the closest possible allies and partners in the European Union. For the first time in that troubled history, there was truly a working as a partnership of equals alongside other European states. Yep. Now, and again it gives me, and I suspect it gives the Irish no pleasure in this either, the boot has, has, which has historically been on the foot of the UK is now on the other foot. As Robert Cooper wrote in the FT, the smallest insiders, Dublin in the case of Brexit, matter more than the biggest outsiders, the UK. That tells us everything about solidarity and the working of the European Union. But even here, 
the Irish don't crow, but they've been honest brokers. The best friends any of us can possibly have, any of us can have, are our most critical friends. The one that tell us the truth when we want to see it the least. And I've heard when these matters of truth have come out, Brexiteers getting enraged and annoyed at the truths that they dare speak from Dublin. Can I remind all members here that Ireland is independent and it is not coming back and it's not difficult to see why. Independent states thrive in the European Union. It is a means of strengthening democracy and sovereignty. The EU is a partnership of equals in a way that the UK simply is not. Now, I want to see the Scotland as a full and independent member state of the European Union. That would be healthier in our relationship as a modern, outward-looking nation, as the same way as it's been healthy for the Anglo-Irish relationship as well. Now, here in the UK, people are seeing through this mess. And, Mr Speaker, as we referenced earlier on, at the weekend, hundreds of thousands the length and breadth of the UK marched for our collective futures. Since then, and at the last look, the revocation of Article 50 petition, and this is at the last look, has been signed by 5.5 million people, including 17 per cent of the electorate in my own constituency. Yeah. And that's not even the highest one in Scotland. Millions of people can see what this government cannot. And what this government clearly cannot see, but what these people can see, is that when you are careering towards the cliffs, you slam on the brakes. That's what they're there That's for. Right. On that point, will you give way? And let's not forget that Parliament has that power, as was recognised by the court, has that power because the UK Parliament throughout this has retained and always will retain in these circumstances sovereignty in a way that the Scottish Parliament does not. Spot the difference, everybody. Yeah. The UK Parliament, as a man, member of the EU, retains sovereignty. The Scottish Parliament, as this process has shown us, does not. It may provide a mechanism for doing those all we represent untold damage in this article. And on that point, I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. Yeah, I'm grateful to uh, my Honourable Friend for giving way. He's making a very powerful speech. Yeah. Uh, I, wonder, I just want to ask him about something the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster said from the Treasury bench earlier when he said that revoking Article 50 could only ever be done once and it would be permanent and could never be reversed. Has he, like me, read the decision of the Grand Chamber of the Court of Justice? Does he, like me, agree that the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster has got that wrong? And if this House chose to revoke Article 50, it would be possible, possible at some point in the future to re-notify yes. Article 50 notice, provided that was done in good faith. Well, as usual, my honourable and learned friend makes a very, very powerful point. I know she tried to intervene on the Chancellor of the Duchy, but I know that the Treasury bench will be listening to that and will be taking note of that as well. Do you know what really struck me today as well? We were told the biggest problem is the European elections. Let me tell them something. The biggest problem with this is not the European elections. The biggest problem is not people um, taking part in a democratic election. <laughs> The biggest problem are the jobs the government's plans are, co are, are, are going to be costing, the public services that will be hit by this Brexit, yep. Yep. and the opportunities for future generations yeah, that yeah. all of us have had and that we will deny to them. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. biggest problem aren't these parliamentarians being elected. And let me tell the members something else. What the European Parliament does is each and every member of the European Parliament is elected. It sits at the heart of the European project. We sit in a parliament where not even half of the parliamentarians who serve here yeah, are true. elected. It's a disgrace. It really is a disgrace. This will cause us a huge amount of damage just because they want to avoid the democracy and scrutiny that comes with a European Parliament election. But, Mr Speaker, I'm not that surprised when we have a Prime Minister who, as we heard today, opposes a referendum, opposes giving people a say in this momentous decision, and is even opposed to respecting the will of Parliament, as we are being told. Now, if the Brexit debate has done anything, it has shown that the UK and the way in which it operates is no longer fit for purpose, as the House of Lords amply <coughs> illustrates. Yeah, yeah. The EU is not perfect. No union involving 28 sovereign and independent member states 
ever can be. However, critically, it has the checks and balances to protect the smallest members from the largest. Ah. Ah. Now, within the UK, we have a constitutional setup that is somewhat outdated, that is not caught up with the momentous decisions that we are having to make now. Yep. But in the EU, you have a modern and up to date relationship between member states, a partnership of equals, a true partnership of equals. And I say this to a government that has failed to respect devolution throughout this process. The EU would not be allowed to do that. It cannot be allowed to do that. And to the people of Scotland, our message is this. There is a better way of doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a better way that our, that our friends and neighbours, our nearest neighbours in places like Ireland and Denmark are pursuing successfully. Here, here. This is not as good as it gets. Here, here. <laughs> but in the meantime, and until that point, it's up to each and every one of us to continue to work as constructively as we can. Now, I don't want to see our friends and neighbours from south of the border being dragged over a cliff edge by an out of touch and irresponsible group of Tories anti EU ultras. No country deserves that. Now, the easiest thing for any of us in Scotland would be to say we voted against this. It's not our problem. But actually, it is our problem. Yeah, yeah. And it remains our problem at the moment. <coughs> and we can't just say, well, the Tories made this mess, it's for them to clear up because it is clear they are incapable of clearing up here, the mess here, that they have made. Here, here. The damage that these plans would do to everyone across these islands would be devastating for us all and felt for decades to come. I will thank the members again and those who have worked constructively. Today's motion provides a start, but it is only that, a start and undoing this devastating Brexit that has been brought to us by a Tory party that's out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.